Hello there, welcome to my channel, welcome back. If you've been here before, today is combo day on the kit of the week, which is the MiG-31 Foxhound in 170 second scale from ICM. I'll start off by having a look at the history of the MiG-31 with some historical material. I'll have a look at what you get in the box for your money and then of course I'll show you how to make the kit. Now all of these bits come as chapters. You can hop backwards and forwards as your heart desires. Now if you enjoy the video and hope you do, do please remember to say so by giving it a thumbs up like below and also if you haven't done so yet to subscribe to the channel. You do that by clicking on the small logo down there in the bottom right corner. It doesn't cost you anything and it really helps me out. And of course if you want to give a bit more concrete support to the channel you can do that through super thanks below and you can do that through Patreon or through Buy Me A Coffee. Links to both of those are in the information box underneath. Enough of all of that, let's get on and make a start by looking at the history of the MiG-31 Foxhound. The MiG-31, with NATO reporting named Foxhound, is a supersonic long-range interceptor designed in the Soviet Union. It was intended as a replacement for the MiG-25 Foxbat. Indeed, it shares many design features with the earlier aircraft, but has substantially better avionics and flight characteristics. The MiG-25 was very fast, intended to provide long-range interception against American supersonic bombers, such as the B-58 Hustler and the projected B-70 Valkyrie, and high-flying reconnaissance aircraft, such as the Lockheed U-2 but changing threats, primarily the advent of modern cruise missiles, demanded a changing thinking. The MiG-31 was developed from the MiG-25 by having a longer fuselage with a seat for a weapon systems operator and a new radar capable of engaging multiple small targets close to the ground. Extended range weapons were developed to try to shoot down cruise missile carriers before launch. Finally, the MiG-31 would provide strategic air defence in areas outside of the Soviet Union's powerful nets of surface-to-air missiles. The prototype of the Foxhound, called the YE-155MP, flew in September 1975, and the MiG-31 entered service in 1981. Powered by two Solovyev D-30F6 engines, the aircraft is restricted by thermal limits to a top speed of Mach 2.83. Matched with the Vimpel R-33 missile, known to NATO as the AA-9 Amos, the Zaslon Passive Phase Array radar has a detection range of around 200 kilometers for fighter-sized targets. Contract 10 at one time and engage 4 simultaneously. The MiG-31 can also be linked to other friendly aircraft to share data, vastly improving the spatial coverage of a defensive network. The MiG-31 went on to replace the long-range Tu-128 Fiddler interceptor, as well as the intended MiG-25. In service, the MiG-31 underwent improvement programs, including avionics updates, enabling it to carry a range of air-to-surface missiles. The MiG-31K, was adapted to launch the KH-47M2 Kinjal, a ballistic hypersonic missile with conventional or nuclear warheads. The latest update, the MiG-31BM, has an improved radar with the ability to track 24 targets and engage six at once with the new R-37 missile, known to NATO as the AA-13 Axe Head. Other armaments include an internal 23mm cannon heat-seeking missiles such as the R-73 and the KH-31P air-to-ground missile, as well as conventional bombs. Production of the MiG-31 ended in 1994, with 519 aircraft having been built. It continues to be operated by the Russian Air Force and by the Kazakh Air Force, which inherited the aircraft during the collapse of the Soviet Union. The first ICM kit of the MiG-31 appeared in 2005, but this was just a rebox of the Condor kit of 2001 with new decals. 
In 2006, ICM released their own new tool of the Foxhound. This has been reboxed three times since, most recently in 2015. The kit also has another life under the Hasegawa brand, in which it first appeared in 2020. The most recent tuning available and the easiest to buy is from Trumpeter in 2016. A notable release of this was with the KH-47 missile in a box from 2019. The first kit of the MiG-31 available in 172nd was the Ace Hobby kit of 1988. The following year, this appeared under the Revel name. Zvezda released their tuning of the MiG-31 in 2000 and have kept the same moulds for their nine subsequent re-releases, including in 2017 as a model set with paints, brushes and glue. The Condor release of 2001, I mentioned earlier, appeared both under the Eastern Express name from 2007 and the Mr. Craft release of 2017, as well as that first ICM release. The MiG-31 is also available in other scales, including in 148th by Avant Garde and Hobby Boss, and in the strange 133rd scale by Fly Model. The box has some reasonably nice artwork and it opens from the top. The contents are not too closely packed in. On the top here is the instruction sheet. This includes a diagram showing the placement of all the parts on the sprue. The parts themselves come in a cellophane bag. Also in the box is the small sheet of decals. Let's have a look at these bits in more detail. There are four plastic sprues all told. Sprue A has just the upper and lower fuselage halves. Sprue B has most of the rest of the structure, the wings, tails, undercarriage and so on. On sprue C we have the inlets and exhausts, nose cone and the weapons. These are three types of missiles. Finally sprue D has all the transparencies. Note that the window frames aren't moulded on these so you'll have to figure out where they are yourself. The transparent plastic is quite grubby. Overall the moulding is quite good with very fine detail lines and a bit of surface muck. I think I'll probably need to wash them. There are a few bits of flash at the edges but otherwise not too bad at all. But Spruce C has the worst flash notably around the missiles and on these engine intakes so these will need a bit of work on them but nothing too terrible to be honest. The edges of the exhausts would also need a bit of a clean up. The instruction sheet is no nonsense with just three pages for the whole build. On the back are the colour callouts, all referenced to Humbrol colours. There's a separate scheme layout and decal placement sheet for two aircraft. The decals themselves are few, with only one stencil I can see. Colours are okay, but not printed as sharply as modern decals and there's one small area where ink is missing. We'll see how we go with them, but if you want the best finish, you'll probably be looking to aftermarket sets. I've washed the parts in dilute detergent, then given them a gentle coat of primer. Now, a lot of pieces are right up against the sprue, so you'll be using a craft knife or very expensive, very pointy nippers to get them off. Take care as the plastic feels a little bit soft. I'm starting with the ejection seats. They have a centerpiece and two side pieces on each seat. The middle of the seat gets painted black. The cockpit tub is getting a coat of mid green. It's not the right color but it's close enough for a closed cockpit. I'll also paint the inside walls of the fuselage. Next to the instrument panels, these come with nothing at all other than the big radar screen moulded in, so I've used a ragtag mix of old spares from a Sea King, a Harrier and a Hurricane, 
painted the screen green and then used a toothpick to dot some odd switches here and there. Shout out to Randy Taylor for reminding me of that trick. I think the panels actually end up looking okay. The sides of the seat can now get their light grey colour. With all that done, I can start assembling the cockpit with the instrument panels going in first. Then the control columns, I'll paint them black in a moment. And then the seats go in, well, for the moment anyway. While there's a setting, there are two small panels that need to go into the lower fuselage. These support the main gear legs later on. Make sure you've drilled the holes out to size. Right, now the cockpit tub can go into the bottom half of the fuselage. Then the upper half can go on top. Now, remember I said the seats were there for a moment? Well, I found it a lot easier to put the fuselage together without the seats then put them in later on. Anyway, plenty of clamps to hold the fuse together while it dries. Next, the fins and the rear fuselage, and there is a lot of flash on these parts, as you can see. Cut it nearly to size and then sand to a finish. Overall, there is quite a lot of flash in this kit. And when those are done, the fittings slot into place and the rear fuselage slides into place. There's going to be a lot of work to get these seams to meet up and be anywhere near level. Anyway, when they're in place, clamps again. Next is this little fairing that comes in two halves and then sits on top of the rear fuselage. I think it's the brake chute housing. On then to the intake ramps. The ramps go inside the outer wall of the intake first, then the inner wall is fitted onto it. When complete, the intake box sits on the side of the fuselage and kind of fits around this spill ramp on the top. The engine exhausts can go onto the back of the fuselage. They are huge. And after that, I can put the nose cone on. Now the outer wing section slides under the inner wing section of the upper surface like this. I love how the designer has made the break at the very large wing fence and not at the fuselage. Really good work. Clamp, clamp and clamp again. While all that's drying, I'm going to work on the wheels. Just make sure the center hole here is cleaned out using a drill bit. Then the halves of the wheels can be glued together. With the wings set, it's time to add the tailplanes or horizontal stabilizers. These just poke through holes in the back. Then it's time to clean up all those panel joints. I'm using this stuff called Perfect Plastic Putty. It's pre-mixed water soluble, so it can be smoothed easily and it's very fine grained. Best of all, it dries in about an hour. It's a lot easier to use for small to medium sized cracks than something like Milliput. As you can see, there is quite a lot of it being used while I'm fitting this back of the instrument panel. With the wheels set and sanded, I'm going to start painting them, steel wheels in the middle and rubber for the tires. Now before I go any further, I must remember to put the ejection seats back in. Because next, I'm putting on the canopy. The canopy glass here is really grubby. You can just make out the break between the hazy and even more hazy bit that hints at the window positions. I'll do what I can and mask them with tape. Given how flash ridden the kit is, the clear parts go on like a dream with just the tiniest drop of ultra thin cement to hold them in place. Okay, so initial sanding done and I'm gonna give the whole thing a coat of light gray primer. This will show the areas I need to revisit with filler and sanding. There are some more bits to go on. This IRST unit slots in under the nose and this electronics pod goes under the fuselage. Then when I'm happy with the surface, I'll do a final coat of gray primer. Next, I'm gonna spray on some pre-shading for the seams, nothing too strong, 
so I'm using dark grey instead of black. When that's dry, I'll apply a top colour, a gentle spray all the time. I'm using a dark ghost grey as the closest thing I've got to Humbrol 166, as suggested. Just go over it lightly until you get the desired effect. Now with the fuselage paint drying, I'm going to make a start on the undercarriage. First thing to do here is drill out some of the holes as they're a bit messed up. Then I can add the main wheels to their bogies. There's also a supporting strut that goes on the side of the main gear leg you need to fit now. And while that's dry, I'll do some of the panel lines. Now I tend to go in quite strongly with the diluted wash and then quickly wipe off any excess. I can also paint the exhaust burnt iron inside and dark steel outside. Now I've masked off the nose radome for a coat of medium gunship grey. I'm also painting the various ECM detection panels freehand. And then back at the nose I'll paint the anti-glare black panel. Now for the fun part where the instructions are a little vague. The nose and the carriage is straightforward, just slots into place nicely, but the main gear is another story. Don't pre-assemble it as the instructions suggest. First of all, the main gear leg needs to go into place. There's a small hole. If you can get the very small alignment peg into it, I couldn't as I had to sand down all the sides to get the gear in at all. So get that positioned in the right place first. Hold it with a bit of glue. Next you then have the front actuator arm. Now again, there is a locator hole, but again, I couldn't fit it in because I needed to sand the piece down to size. So it just went roughly into the right place. The important thing is it attaches to the inside of the main gear leg. While it's drying, maybe you can fit the pylons for the weapons. I'm just using the inner pylons on my model today. Now the gear doors come as a complete closed unit, so you have to chop them up into the constituent doors. These go into place relatively simply. And at the front of the bay are the air brakes. There's an actuator piston that sets the angle of the open door correctly. The nose gear bay doors also need to be cut apart, but first of all we'll do the inside of the landing lights with some aluminium paint. The lamp covers drop into place very well and are secured with a drop of ultra thin cement. Then the door can be cut into its parts. And whilst those are drying up I'll add the decals, there are very few of them, but they do bring a splash of welcome colour to the grey. When I'm happy with them, the nose gear doors can go into place. Then I'll fit the R33 or AA9 Amos missiles under the fuselage. These come in halves and have been painted white and aluminium. Note how the nose cone of the missile tucks right up against the nose wheel door. Now I'm going to fit the actual nose wheels and I'll touch up the paint on them in a moment. Now the main gear bogies can go on. This fit is frankly rubbish, so what I'm going to do is tack them into place with super glue before filling the joint with polystyrene cement. Anyway, when it's all set, I can take off the canopy masks, add the last missiles on the wings, a few antennas, and the kit, surprisingly, is already done. Let's start with the fact that this is a 2006 kit from Ukraine and by modern standards is not the best moulding. Plenty of flash and really not great panel fitting. Oddly, the panel lines are really finely moulded and bits like the overwing fence are delicate and crisply done. But you know what, this big old thing cost me just over a fiver in a sale, so I'm not complaining too much. And of course it gives me plenty of scope to practice some modelling skills. ICM has come a huge way since those days, as the recent OV10 Bronco will show you if you make one, but these early kits are all right to build if you've the patience and a bit of knowledge. 
So there we have the MiG-31. Now, if you've enjoyed this, and I hope you have, then please do remember to say so by clicking on the like logo below, the little thumbs up. And also, if you haven't done so yet, please do subscribe to the channel. All you have to do is click on the logo down there. It doesn't cost you anything, it helps me out enormously. In any case, I hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye.